Okay, great. All right, well, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, well, welcome. Thanks so much for sticking it out. I know post-lunch um, and post-Archivist of the United States is a hard uh, act to follow. My name is Sophia Becerra-Licha. I am the lead archivist at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And this afternoon, I am going to chat a little bit about what we've been up to both in establishing the archives at the Kennedy Center, um, as well as a new permanent exhibit that opened last September. Um, just out of curiosity, before you knew about the program, how many of you knew that there was an archives at the Kennedy Center? Okay, that's pretty good, you're my people. How many of you have uh, been to the exhibit, if any? Excellent, awesome. All right, um, so I always like to start with a little bit of context. Um, I'll talk about some of the, um, the unique setting of the archives at the Kennedy Center, um, what we've been up to, um, and I'll walk through some of the thought process of the exhibit itself. So first, oh, sorry, give me one second. Great. Um, so as you may know, the Kennedy Center holds a dual uh, role as both the nation's performing arts center as well as a living memorial to President Kennedy. Um, as such, we are an incubator for the arts. We both present art on our stages, but we also commission, provide educational opportunities, um, and um, do so much more than just serve as the, the nation's stage. Um, more historical context that I always like to give um, for the archives in particular is this um, timeline and basically three takeaways. One, which is that from the start, the Kennedy Center was a bipartisan effort. You may know that we opened in 1971, we're named for President Kennedy, but the planning for the Kennedy Center actually dates back to the Eisenhower administration in the late 50s, um, and it finally opened under President Nixon, um, and President Johnson um, actually broke ground and signed the Renaming Act. So that's point one I like to make here. Um, the other is that if you look at 1971 to 2019 when the archives started, that's nearly 50 years of history to catch up on. Um, and if you do the math, that's 2019, 50th anniversary in 2021. We all know what happened between 2019 and 2021, so you can get a sense of some of what we were um, up against and you know, an anniversary deadline that doesn't change even for world events. Um, the third um, point that I make here as well is that our Kennedy Center history also includes the history of our affiliates, the Washington National Opera um, and the National Symphony Orchestra, both of which even predate the center. Um, so it's a bit of a truck question. It's actually more than 50 years of history, um, and we have had our work cut out for us. So our mission in a nutshell as an archives is to create order out of chaos. Um, I didn't pick the most chaotic photo on the left, just because I figured you could use your imaginations. Um, but we essentially take the piles on the left um, and make it look like the tidier piles on shelving instead of on the floor on the right. That is our overall goal um, in a nutshell. The archives was established in 2019 as part of a larger strategic initiative to rethink the role of the memorial. Um, and to do a better job of institutional storytelling. A lot of people think of the Kennedy Center as a place to come and see a performance, um, but they may not be entirely sure why it's named for President Kennedy, why there is that connection, um, and why we have the, the role that we do. In terms of what we collect, um, and I do have a poster um, downstairs that has all of the highlights, so you don't necessarily have to take notes. You're welcome to take a photo. Um, but we essentially collect the center's administrative and performance history. So programs, photos, some ephemera, some AV, um, lots and lots of playbills. The good news is a lot of people collected playbills. The bad news is a lot of people collected playbills. Um, and so we actually have a pretty good run and it is um, something uh, we're not actively collecting at this point. We are just trying to figure out what we have. Um, so against that backdrop, a little bit about us. I'm here representing as the lead archivist. At this point, we have grown to a team of three full-time staff members um, and a part-time staff member, a processing archivist, an archives coordinator, um, and a part-time um, processing assistant who was primarily tasked with aforementioned playbills, which kept her very busy. In terms of our context and challenges, 
we inherited about 6,000 cubic feet of content and, and growing. Um, we started off with, I think, materials in about 17 different locations across campus. We're down to, I think, around a dozen, which is an accomplishment. Um, and we've also consolidated, so AV is with AV, photos are with photos, um, and we're you know, thinking big and trying to consolidate even further. Um, as is often the case, we didn't inherit very many inventories. Um, and our office, if you know anything about the Kennedy Center, it is very tight on space. So our office is actually located off-site across the street in one of the Watergate buildings. Um, so there's actually a staff walking challenge. My team won it. And most of those steps, they won by you know, just fulfilling a reference request, doing processing, building shelving, um, moving things around. Like We definitely get our exercise in. And then at the bottom of this slide, um, I've just picked out um, a range of the things that we have. Again, primarily uh, photos um, and paper materials, but we also have, that's actually my hand with the blue glove, um, some of the red carpet. If you've ever been to any of the main spaces, you'll recognize that particular shade of crimson. Um, one of our more unique, tiny um, items is a little viewfinder. You click through slides. It's a virtual tour, but the analog version of it, you click through slides and it's shaped like a TV. Since President Kennedy was known as the TV president, um, we're assuming it was sold um, at the gift shop, um, but we haven't really found a lot more context on it. It's just a really fun, tiny, um, great item to take on the road. Um, the middle image is the playbills, just a very small number of them. When we started, there had actually been a project where they had volunteers cataloging, um, literal card catalog on a typewriter. Um, so we've been you know, working on converting that to online. Um, we have a sample of AV um, in the commemorative record for the opening night program. And then on the right is a sample of the many, many binders of photos negatives, contact sheets, um, and compact disks. Though, since that photo was taken, we've actually processed that collection, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So in terms of starting an archives, um, or building a program, um, or inheriting something from someone else, I often get asked, you know, where do you start? In some ways, we had our work cut out for us because we knew the 50th anniversary was coming. Um, but in other ways, we still had to really get down to the basics. Um, so we really prioritized getting intellectual control. Um, as you can see from the post-it, it might be a little bit faint, but it says save for archivist use, which is essentially the, a lot of the quality of the metadata that we inherited. So <laughs> not super helpful. We had to uh, amplify that a little bit. Um, thinking about systems and procedures, everything from how we got materials back and forth to how people would access them to defining our collecting scope um, and figuring how to staff and balance priorities. Um, processing, and then of course the 50th anniversary. There were actually two exhibits around the 50th anniversary, um, and I'll get into them in a little bit more detail. One was a temporary campus takeover. If you went to the Kennedy Center and walked into either the Grand Foyer, sorry, the Hall of States or the Hall of Nations and saw the hanging 50 made out of window cards, those are actually all deaccession duplicates um, of window cards from the various decades. Um, and that was up from 2021 to 2022 and then the new JFK gallery that opened as well. Um, so two tall orders, a large backlog, multiple storage locations. Um, but from the start, we really um, tried to prioritize storytelling and access and thinking incrementally um, and building a, a community. Um, in my last job, I also established an archives um, and something that I thought a lot about there, even though the constraints were different, was there's no use in building a technically perfect repository, if there even is such a thing, um, if you haven't brought people along with you. Um, so you'll see a lot of sort of starts and stops and experiments, but ultimately what we were trying to do was get people excited um, and aware that we existed, especially on campus. So we prioritized for the 50th anniversary, since we obviously couldn't prior process everything, 
um, early records. So I've just included a couple of scans from what we've called our National Cultural Center collection. Um, if you're familiar with Kennedy Center history, DC history, you may recognize this image. This was actually the original design for the Kennedy Center, which if you know now, it's rectangular, very angular. Um, but this was designed by the same architect. Some people have described it as a spaceship. Some people have pointed out it looks very similar to the Watergate buildings that are right across the street. Um, it was still a white marble building. It still included multiple performing spaces and multi-use spaces. Um, ultimately, it just wasn't um, financially and logistically feasible. So that's one of the kinds of things that we have. Um, we also have good coverage of the opening of the center. This is one of my um, favorite shots of the opening night um, uh, standing ovation. We also have rehearsals, preview performances, um, the program. I actually have a copy of the um, commemorative bound record uh, program with me if you'd like to see it. Um, and we were also really lucky to inherit um, our one of the theater managers sort of personal archives, um, and that included an autographed copy of the opening night program um, and a ticket as well. Um, and these are also featured in the JFK gallery as well, so you're getting a bit of a sneak peek. So once we had the 50th anniversary behind us, like I said, we took a multi-pronged approach, and even as we were focusing on the 50th anniversary, on getting into um, intellectual control over materials, Something else that was really important was tracking how materials were getting used, even from the very start, um, even if we weren't at first seeing a huge volume. Um, and what we quickly realized was that performance history and photos were our top two um, areas of requests. Um, so for this particular fiscal year, which we recently wrapped up, so I'm still wrapping my brain around our stats and numbers and where we are. Uh, we focused on photos, we focused on the program collection, um, we focused on board of trustees, which actually get used a lot um, for uh, institutional purposes, um, Kennedy Center honors, public relations records that help tell the story um, of that award and that event, um, and the American College Theater Festival records, which actually predate the center. You can see the photo on the left is actually uh, a group of students touring the building um, while it's still under construction. Um, you can see behind the roof isn't quite complete. So as I mentioned, um, we tried to do a lot of things at once. We're still doing a lot of things at once. Um, the archives is located um, within the public relations department. Um, and so from the start, we tried to think you know, strategically of ways to start incorporating content once we had a sense of what we had. So the top set of images are from the 50th anniversary exhibit that I mentioned. This was a campus takeover that we had to think very creatively about because we were planning essentially in August of 2020 when we didn't really know what September of 2021 was going to look like. Um, this is a great example of working with our sort of local experts, our international programming department, um, regularly puts on large-scale festivals and does really creative exhibits. And so we were able to partner with them um, to essentially have a campus takeover. Um, we featured photos for the three main halls on the grand foyer level and um, just blew up photos of highlights from each of the 50 years. Um, we recorded a series of oral histories, which are up online. Um, and we even commissioned um, a portrait contest. And all of this is still up digitally um, on, the, on the website. It's called If These Halls Could Talk. Um, and keep in mind that all of this happened with the archives being shut down for four months um, from April until August. Um, so it's two exhibits in two years, even though not necessarily all the, the work was on the archives end. Um, the other is Art and Ideals, which I'll talk about because it's a, a really interesting um, project that involved a lot of um, external partners um, and really thinking through you know, who needed to be at the table to make sure that we were telling a story that was um, historically accurate, um, but one that was also challenging because if you think about what I said at the beginning, the Kennedy Center Archives focuses on the history of the center. The JFK Gallery, as I'll go into a little bit more detail, is more the history of President Kennedy. Um, so that is something that we had to look externally to, um, to sort of fill in some gaps. 
while we were doing those big things, we were also thinking of ways to organically, again, um, stoke interest and have the archives be seen as a, a trusted repository and a trusted partner. So we started small. Um, archives is part of public relations. Public relations sends out um, weekly or biweekly emails of clips of Kennedy Center coverage. Um, and so we thought, you know, what if we pick one of those days, Archives Wednesday, and we feature some archives content? Um, Hopefully it also means that more people open that email because <laughs> we do get a lot of emails. Um, but you know, from that we have gotten um, project requests. Um, we uh, actually heard from HR who said, "Oh, we actually have a newsletter too. Could you, you know, help us uh, curate some content um, more focused on um, staff history as well?" Um, and actually, one thing that's not um, on there yet um, is our friends volunteer program recently restarted their newsletter, and we've been partnering with them as well. So again, thinking big, thinking small, thinking about you know what existing communications or structures or partnerships um, might make for for a productive um, a productive venture. And then of course, social media. We were very lucky. Um, to have a, a small but very dedicated social media team. Our hashtag is Kensen Archives. And we uh, most recently actually did a archives takeover on Instagram for Ask an Archivist Day, if you had a chance to check that out. Um, and so we've done everything from on this day, something interesting that we found, to around the holidays last year, um, recreating a holiday recipe from one of the fundraiser cookbooks. So it's just you know a way to you know show what we're up to, what the archives can do, um, and again, it's something that's generated a lot of goodwill on campus, even while we're still you know sorting and trying to consolidate and trying to get a handle on what we have. Um, so next, I am going to talk a little bit about the JFK exhibit. Um, this was a multi-year project. If you've been up to the exhibit, you know that the archives content is featured in one of the entrances um, in the section that focuses on how the Kennedy Center came to be. Um, there were, because it is immersive, has a lot of multimedia, and has a strong historical component, um, we made sure to bring in a panel of historians who could really make sure that there was a, a there there, that if we were saying there is a connection between President Kennedy and the arts, you know, we had someone who could um, speak to diplomacy, civil rights, um, arts and culture, the Kennedy Center, sorry, the Kennedy White House, um, and then various designers to make sure that all of the technology would work. And so, I'm just going to um, go over and play, it's like a two minute video. I know when we did the test, there was a bit of a, an issue with the sound. Don't worry about it. I think if you're on Zoom, you won't be able to hear it. It's just some light instrumental music. The words on the, tap, on the screen are, are really all that you need. Um, and then I'm going to walk through each of the components. So that gives you a little bit of a, a feel of what you walk into. Um, but next I want to talk a little bit about the thought process behind it. So we wanted to be able to answer the question, why is the Kennedy Center named for JFK? We wanted to really connect visitors to how the current legacy and the activities of the Kennedy Center um, connect to his work. We know that the Kennedy Center attracts um, audiences and visitors from all over, of all ages. We know that increasingly there are fewer people um, who knew of President Kennedy or were alive um, during his presidency. 
Um, and we also wanted something that made good use of technology, since obviously President Kennedy um, made use of the technology of his time, but that wouldn't feel dated, um, and that would accommodate both a user that you know had 15 minutes was coming for the first time, someone who has you know subscription tickets, um, and it's their 15th time. So it had to fulfill a lot of different uses. Um, it's also an exhibit that is primarily um, it consists of either duplicates um, or loans um, and really just a lot of creative storytelling. Um, it's also, if you've been up there, um, kind of a thoroughfare and a long space. So the way that it's designed, you can enter from either way and the two entrances are, are more or less parallel. If you enter um, through one side, you start with the history of President Kennedy and particularly his love of literature and books that influenced him on um, his writings. If you enter from the other side, and there's no right or wrong, I'm partial to the archive side, but there's no right or wrong, um, you have a timeline of how the Kennedy Center came to be and you have duplicates um, from the archival collections. And then in the center, um, the heart, there are essentially four quadrants. Um, that focus on art and democracy, art and social change, art and culture, art in the White House. Um, and then within those, it was also really important that those historical moments were connected to what the Kennedy Center is doing now. So there are also pillars, what we call the Kennedy Center today, where each of those themes is connected to a current Kennedy Center program as well. And that content will also get refreshed a little bit more um, regularly. So for instance, if there's content on Kennedy Center honors, um, we wanna make sure that that's not too far out of date. Um, so these are the, the pillars, uplifting the artist, exporting the arts, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, each of these sections um, also includes a couple of interactives. I'm just gonna flip through to make sure that we're not taking too much time. Um, so one of the interactives is what's called Dinner at the White House. Um, it's part of the art and culture section. And here they took lists of guests who had attended um, Kennedy's uh, White House dinners. So artists, scientists, big thinkers of the day. Um, and then they tried to think who might be some contemporaries today. Um, and the idea is that you can have multiple people. It's set up like a dining table. There are quotes around different themes. And so you can either explore on your own or if there are multiple people at the table, there are opportunities for spontaneous connections if multiple people from different disciplines um, hone in on different connections. Um, so it's just a fun, reflective um, space that tries to tie, again, sort of um, history to the present day and to really think about a lot of what the Kennedy White House did in terms of um, arts diplomacy. Another and probably the more um, popular interactive is the opportunity, and of course with a social media component as well, because you can get a selfie, um, to have to take a photo um, and essentially choose a, a color palette, um, make some brush strokes, and have your portrait done in the style of Elaine de Kooning, who obviously did a really famous portrait of um, JFK. Um, for a while, quite a few staff members actually had that as their like Microsoft icon <laughs> for email as well, because um, it's a it's a fun one. Um, President Kennedy was known for his um, oratorical skills, um, so the power of words is a reflective wall um, where words from quotes of his are um, reflected and it works based on proximity. If you approach a word, the rest of the quote comes together and you hear his words. Um, and you also literally are reflected in his words and have a, an opportunity to, to see yourself in him, see yourself um, in the words. And again, another selfie moment because we are in the social media age. Um, so this, again, is the sort of big view. You can see at the top, there are a lot of screens, but surrounding the center part uh, at the very top is what we've called the multimedia freeze. And this functions in different ways. Um, sometimes it acts as the headers for the four quadrants. Sometimes the lights go down and we have what are called takeover moments. So there are three or four Kennedy speeches 
it's very important that you could hear his words and sort of feel like you are in the audience. Um, so the lights will dim um, and he'll show up on the screens on either way and there will be crowd shots and it's kind of like you're immersed and listening um, to him speak. Um, and then there are also some environmental shots. Um, so on the top, you have the center lit up for honors. You also have in the middle the iconic chandeliers from the, the opera house. So there's a lot um, that happens there. So that's kind of a, a whirlwind of what we've been up to, um, some of the challenges, this new exhibit. Um, I am, you know, with my people among archivists, um, and so I also like would like to take a moment to think through, you know, lessons learned, where we go from here, um, at what comes next. Um, not because I think that these are particularly unique, um, but as was said in the previous session, sometimes the power of events like these is, oh, I'm not the only one thinking that particular thing. Or if you're somewhere small, sometimes there's also power in saying, hey, I went to a conference and another person said the exact same thing that I've been saying. <laughs> but you maybe listen <laughs> if I can say that two other people have said it that's not just me. Um, so when I think about things that have you know, worked um, for us, things that I focus on are you know, having a plan, um, but being flexible, obviously. No one knew how 2020 was going to turn out, even under the best of circumstances. Um, this is my second time starting up in archives. In both cases, I've had a plan. In both cases, that plan has not gone according to plan um, for different reasons. Um, but really just having a sense of what is your institutional context, what is going to be most important, and really just planning flexibly and, and incrementally, but also planning time for a uh, reflection. Um, the second one is really thinking about the relational part of it. Uh, I think as archivists, we know that oftentimes archives and um, personal papers in particular can be really fraught with emotion. Like often you're getting them at a time of transition, a retirement, someone passing away, in this case, an anniversary. Um, but the reality is, uh, you know, so much of what you're doing when you're building a new program is building trust and faith that what you bring to it as an archivist is going to be different than whatever has been hoarded for well, however many years and however many decades. Um, you know, when I first started, you know, there would be, you know, weeks where I would say, I, ha I haven't inventoried anything, but I've talked to a lot of people you know, I've tried to make sure that I have a good sense of what's important to them, how we might partner, uh, and most importantly, that I follow up. I think a lot about the role of trust and things coming in and being sure that people are clear on what that means, um, particularly for um, rules that might not be intuitive, like why things don't circulate. Um, the third is me just being pragmatic because I've mostly worked in fairly small repositories, which is, you know, not reinventing the wheel, really trying to think incrementally um, and within existing structures. I give the example of the um, public relations email clips um, and how that led to like presentations and other opportunities, um, but was particular to our um, institutional context. Um, and while I said there are a lot of things that I would change, the one battle I am glad that I stuck to was really prioritizing intellectual control over everything else. If you look at the sort of Kennedy Center archives timeline of when our content started exploding on social media and in general, it's when we finished the comprehensive collection survey. Because I knew from experience, I wanted to make sure that if we were scanning things on demand or for requests, I was going to be able to find the original, <laughs> that I was going to be able to find the thing again, um, that we weren't going to lose um, the context. So that is where I had to use some of that goodwill of, no, 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 I know what I'm doing. This is going to pay off, I promise. Um, and it was true, it did, it did actually pay off. Um, so with that being said, I you know, hope that this has piqued your interest either in coming to the exhibit, in making use of the archives. The next shot that I'm gonna, or the next slide that I'm gonna show 
is I have my uh, email, I have my business card. We also, among the many things we've been doing in the background, have developed a service desk where you can contact us um, to uh, request an appointment, to request information, um, even with a, a relatively soft launch. I'm really happy to see that people are finding us. Our users include everything, everyone from K through 12 students and teachers, folks from higher ed, um, folks working um, in the media, on documentaries, academic research, independent research, um, as well as patrons. Some of my favorite requests are, you know, I was a child several decades ago. I think I went to this performance. Can you help me confirm, you know, some of the details? Or, you know, on a more touching level, we've actually had several folks with um, ties who said, you know, I, like, met my partner at the Kennedy Center or, you know, preparing eulogies or other things. And so um, we are here for use. It's what makes being in windowless, a dozen different, you know, windowless closets, um, making sense of things that were left behind at the end of the day. It's, it's really all about um, use. Um, and yes, this photo is from our survey. We did actually find a folder that said questions and answers. It was empty. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so now I just use it as my ending slide. Um, and I also have our hashtag on there, as I said. Um, we uh, partner with social media, so if you look up the Kennedy Center channels, particularly Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter, and even Medium, um, we've written um, quite a few blog posts and things and post really regularly. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions for me, thoughts for me, um, I see this as the start of a conversation a collaboration, and I see you all as partners in helping us get out the word. Oh, and you already have a question. That's great. Does anybody have a question? Yeah, we actually have one. Doing... Yeah, yeah, no, he has one. Well, but I think we need it for Zoom. Yeah, we need it for the Zoom. thing. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. Do you want to just come up and use my mic? Probably. Do you want to come in? Here, I'll get it. Thank you. Then I'll bring it right back. Here you go. Okay. Um, so first, kind of the big professional archivist question. Um, does the Kennedy Center have a, any sort of institutional records management guidance? And if not, or, or, or if so, what relationship does your organization have with a records management? And the second really quick question, I'm just curious, do y'all get discounts to their shows? <laughs> I'll take the second one first. Um, we do, they tend to be last minute and a little bit unpredictable. Um, so if there's something I know I want to go to, I will just buy the ticket. Um, for records management, it's an interesting question. We do have um, draft schedules, but it's also an area where there hasn't been a full-time trained records manager. So we are, we have worked closely um, with the role that's traditionally been assigned to that, but it's essentially been a quarter to half of another person's job. Um, so we focused on the part of the schedules that indicate things coming to archives rather than the sort of compliance destruction part. Um, but that, figuring out records management, figuring out um, electronic um, records management um, and digitization, I would say, are some of the things coming up next. That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so in regards to the loans and the donations that you receive for the exhibitions, um, as an archivist, loaning something out is like, makes my skin crawl. Um, without getting into names of individuals as such, who, who loaned the objects or any institutions or was it uh, JFK Library or any other collection from the family? Um, what repository was willing to loan? Sure. In terms of loans, it's primarily um, 
one, I'm trying to think, there's one object. Most of what's in the exhibit, honestly, is reproductions um, and media, and they came from, I mean, it's a huge spreadsheet of, of repositories, Library of Congress, the National Archives, um, Alvin Ailey, the JFK Library, obviously. I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a lot of breath. Um, we do have um, a camera on loan that was used to um, video um, President Kennedy um, for like a documentary, and that was worked out um, directly with the estate and with legal and just making sure that it is all very, very clear. Um, as an archivist, I also want to be super, super, super clear about that. Um, so we made sure um, that, we, that we had something that everyone would be happy with. But yeah, I probably should have clarified. The vast majority are, are reproductions, which still brings its challenges in terms of um, rights and reproductions and promotional use. Anybody else? I've got a question for you. So I'm wondering about uh, with the performances that you have, the center there, in terms of props or other ephemera or other, you know, design things that you have for shows and performances, are you able to preserve any of those? I'm just curious, you know, set design and so forth. What is art? Is that a part of your collection? It's a great question. It's largely out of scope for us. I know that the opera has a warehouse with costumes. Um, and there are other odds and ends, but on our end, we have our hands full just with the administrative and performance history, photos, programs, um, and a few things have, a few random props have survived, but we're not actively collecting in part because we still haven't figured out the, the space um, and consolidating and making sure that if we take something, we can responsibly preserve it, house it, and provide access to it. And I've got a follow-up question for you, too, if I could. In terms of care of the prop, how, the props that are out in the warehouse, sort of someone else is taking care of that at the Opera House, is that correct? Yeah, they have an um, extensive uh, setup. Um, I haven't actually been out there, but I've seen um, video, and it is very well cared for and very extensive. Anybody else? I do have one. I'm going to sit down so I'm not looming over you. Um, the broadcasts that are done, like the Kennedy uh, Awards honors, I should say, Kennedy Center um, honors that happen every year, are those uh, productions on video, do you guys have the uh, rights? Do you have those? Or is that the networks that uh, have that and have it in their own archive? I forget the um, the exact details. I do believe we have access to the recordings, um, but we can't necessarily um, release them independently. There's a whole process where we, if we get their request, it automatically goes to legal, and they sort it out because they get it fairly regularly. That's a good question. Anybody else? Going once. John? No. I was giving it back over to you. <laughs> there you go, bud. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Sophia. Was, uh, this was great. Um, and that concludes our first of the afternoon sessions. Uh,